it is examination time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be re reprobates? The NES says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail? the test. Good morning. This is Billy Robinson with the Prairie Plains Church of Christ, and we welcome you to our Sunday morning study on September the 13th of 2020. We are studying presently the power of the tongue, and our text is going to be found in James chapter 3, verses 3 through 8 today. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me over to this particular chapter. James 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member. And boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defies, defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. In James chapter 3, verse 5, James tells us that the tongue is a little member. It's a small thing. It's a small member of the body. But yet we need to be examining our tongues and going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, to see whether or not our tongues are used in such a way that people can say that we are in the faith that we are standing in the gospel. Do people recognize that Jesus Christ is in you by the way that you use our tongue? Do others know that I am a child of God by the way that I talk, by my conversations, by the words that I choose? The tongue is a small thing. It is a small member of the body. And in verse 3, of James 3, he begins with the word behold. It means to look. He's trying to get their attention to see the truth of his message. He's trying to get their attention to see that they can catch the truth through his illustrations that he's about ready to use. And he uses three illustrations to demonstrate how small the tongue is in comparison to what it controls. The first illustration is found in verse 3, a bit in a horse's mouth. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. If you look very carefully at what a horse has in his mouth and what goes around to the hands of the one that is riding him. The bits in the mouth and the reins go all the way back to what the rider holds. The bit is a piece of iron that puts pressure on the mouth of the horse when the rider pulls on those reins. And there are generally three kinds of bits, all of which use different shapes to put pressure on the tongue. Some are like widened spurs, not sharp, but enough to make, a very, make it very uncomfortable for the horse. Others are like links in a chain. The most common is an iron bar with a curve in it that puts pressure on the tongue of the horse. Little by little, the horse learns that he doesn't want that pain. And he begins to realize that if he goes the direction that the reins are pulling or follows the commands with the reins, he learns 
there is no pain. And so even in the massive horse can be trained to obey if we can put the bit in their mouth and we can, con can control their whole body. In the same way, we can control our tongue. If we are able to do that, we can control our entire body. If you put effort into controlling this animal, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight with the tongue. That's something that we're going to emphasize throughout our lesson today. But if you're able to control your tongue, you're able to change your entire direction that you are headed. Now, the second illustration that James uses is found in verse 4. It is the rudder on a ship. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, a ship's rudder. Whithersoever the governor, that's the pilot or the helmsman, listeth. James' second illustration is that of a large seagoing vessel. These ships are so enormous, and, and, and one man or even a group of men, they have no chance of moving that on their own. But yet these boats can be controlled by means of a very small helm. A man stands at the wheel of the ship as he turns it one way and the other. A very small rudder, in comparison, controls the direction of the boat as if it goes through waves and wind. If you've ever seen a video or maybe seen in person one that's driving a boat get thrown out of a bass boat or a speed boat, what happens to the boat? It goes out of control. There's no one driving the boat. It just goes wherever it wants to. Many times it goes in a circle. It goes in a circle and it moves a few feet at a time. It continues in a circle. That's why it's so dangerous for a one driving a boat not to wear the kill switch, by the way, in the boat. Large boats, small boats can be controlled by something very small, the rudder. If you control the rudder, you can control the ship's entire course. If you can control your tongue, you can control your entire body. This goes back to the idea of works, your words and deeds. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, it says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Then in James chapter 2, verse 12, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. In the third illustration, we have a little fire. In verses 5 and 6. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. So now James makes an application from the previous two illustrations using the bridle and the rudder. The tongue is tiny compared to the horse and the ship. And yet, just as the bridle and the rudder are comparable of exercising great influence upon the horse and the ship, even so, in spite of the fact that the tongue is so tiny, it nevertheless exerts great influence upon the body and upon those that are around him. In fact, it boasteth great things, is what James just said. The tongue can brag, it can boast. In other words, do a lot of great damage. The tongue is also capable of doing the greatest amount of good as well as evil. The tongue is a fire. Now, when you think about a fire, when it's used properly, it can give comfort and warmth. It can be productive in eliminating garbage. It gives light. You can cook with a fire. 
think about the tongue. When it's used properly, it can bring comfort and warmth to the ones listening also. It can do, do away with harmful things by means of uh, apologies or explanations and forgiveness and extending forgiveness and so forth. It can be, bring light to those that hear. In Proverbs 15, 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perseverance therein is a breach in the spirit. The NAS says a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. The NLT says Gent gentle words bring life and health. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24, pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Another translation, good words are honeycombs, and the sweetness thereof is a healing of the soul. Another translation says, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. But we ought, need to also know the danger of the tongue. How great a matter, a little fire kindleth, is what James says about the tongue. It sets on fire the, soul, the course of nature. How does a massive fire start? Usually by a small spark. You look at the massive fires that we've had in California. As of a couple days ago, when I did some research concerning the fires in California, quote, it says more than 2.5 million acres of land have burned in the state this year, nearly 20 times what had burned at this time last year. In Washington, Governor Jay Inslee said that 480,000 acres had burned across the state this week, more than every recent fire season. James tells us that the tongue is a world of iniquity. This world of iniquity would include sins such as the lying tongue, Proverbs 12, verse 22. The flattering tongue, Psalm chapter 12, verse 4. The proud tongue, Psalm chapter 12, verse 5. The overused tongue, when we say too much, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. The swift tongue, speaking before we should, not knowing when to keep our mouths shut. Speaking before we even have all the information. James 1, verse 19. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, the backbiting tongue, Proverbs 25, 23, more evil that the tongue has within its powers, the tail-bearing tongue, spreading unnecessary, often hurtful information about other people, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19, and Leviticus 19, verse 16. We have the cursing tongue, Psalm 109, verse, 109, verse 17. We have the piercing tongue, speaking with unnecessary harshness and severity to someone else. Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. First Timothy chapter five, verse one and two. And we have the silent tongue. There's times that we must not be silent. We need to stand where the Bible stands. Speak as the oracles of God. First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. If you're guilty of no other sin other than the sins of the tongue, you still will be lost eternally. Notice verse 6 again. The inspired word of God states, the tongue defileth the whole body. Defileth has got the E-T-H on it. means that it continues to do so. The word translated here in the Greek means to spot. So if you look at James 1.27, we see the antithesis of this, where we are told to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Fires, although they may not utterly destroy, do spot and contaminate. Have you ever been in someone's home where there's been a fire? How things are, although things may not have been destroyed by the fire itself, they have spots on them maybe from the smoke and the heat and so forth. The tongue does not have to utterly destroy to do damage. It can spot 
and it can make unclean. The text says it's set on fire by hell itself. The sins of the tongue do not originate with God who made the tongue. They originate from hell itself. And to hell the sinful tongue will return. Revelation 21 verse 8. This is James' colorful way of saying that anyone who sins with a tongue is getting their influence from Satan himself. And it makes for an interesting picture, the tongue fire that defiles a man and destroys his life is the hell fire that he is invited into his own body. The tongue does not have to utterly destroy to do its damage. The sins of the tongue do not originate with God, do they? According to verse 7, all animals have been tamed by man. Notice what he says. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. James uses the four classifications of animals that existed from the very beginning of creation that God created. The beast of the field the creeping things, the fowls of the air, and the sea creatures. Go back and compare that to Genesis 1. There is no animal that has not been tamed at some point by mankind, is what James said. And once that animal is tamed, men do not fear it. James showed us that we must never let our guards down when it comes to the tongue. Mankind has been able to domesticate, to tame many animals he once feared, but no one can tame the tongue. This is a hyperbole. He's not saying it is impossible. Otherwise, he is contradicting himself in James 1 verse 26 when he states, If anyone among you seems to be religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. His His religion is useless and vain. He's not contradicting that. It's a hyperbole. James is saying that it is easier to tame the wildest beast than to completely tame the tongue. Most people will try to tame the tongue, but how much time and effort do they really put in it, if at all? It's a beast that only a select few can ever truly tame. When is a wild animal absolutely controlled and perfectly tamed? I don't know that he ever is. There's always that tendency to lash out. I did a little research on animals that were tamed, and I found references of these animals that were tamed attacking their own owners or someone else. It's the same way with their tongue. We can get it under control. But there's always that tendency for it to lash out and so on towards someone else. It's always subject to acting up again. Why? Because we live in the flesh. It's made of the flesh. And we are not perfect. When we think that we have it under control, what must we do? We've got to keep working on it. We can't give up. We've got to continue to keep it within its cage. James says it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison in verse 8. Think of the worst possible beast you can conjure up in your mind. The tongue is more horrifying and difficult. Think about something. How long does it take to tame a wild animal? Overnight? There is no way that you can tame one overnight. Same way with their tongue. We can't tame it overnight, in a few days, in a few weeks, in a few years. Back years ago, many people that lived on farms had a bell. And they would ring the bell at dinner time, telling everyone to come in, it's time to eat. I want to apply something of that nature 
with our tongue with sins that we have in our lives. It's very hard to forgive someone who really has hurt us, isn't it? It, it, it? It's just extremely hard. And what do we do in our minds? And, and what do we do with our tongues? And, and what do we do? We, we keep bringing it up, mulling it over our minds. We keep telling it to somebody. And, and we never give it a rest. We keep mulling over it and mulling over it and bringing it up and thinking about it. And what do we become? We're just hurting ourselves. We're becoming more bitter and bitter and bitter. Think about that dinner bell for a second. As long as she keeps uh, someone, a lady or a man keeps pulling on that rope, ringing that bell, the bell is going to ring. And even when they quit ringing the bell, it still will echo through the countryside, won't it? But when you quit pulling on it, you know that eventually it's going to quit ringing and echoing. The same thing is true with our tongue. The same way it is true with sins in our lives and, and with our ability to forgive others. Quit bringing it up. Quit talking about it. Stop thinking about it all the time. Focus on something else. Stop rehearsing the wrongs in your life. It's, it's like pulling the rope. You keep thinking about it, you keep pulling that rope, and that dinner bell's going to ring. But when you stop pulling the rope, when you quit talking about it, when you quit trying to quit thinking about it all the time, rest assured it's eventually going to quit. This I know, that if we continue to ring that bell, it will keep sounding. Just as with our anger, in an unforgiven tongue. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. When you squeeze a sponge, what came out under the pressure? It's whatever had soaked into the sponge previously, whatever the sponge had soaked up. Same way with her tongue. When her tongues are squeezed, what comes out is what is inside of us, is what we have soaked up. It's what is in our heart. It's what is in our mind. In order to gain control over our tongue, we need to start with the heart and the mind. And that requires heart surgery. That's why we need to examine our hearts. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We cannot think that we will simply change our words and that will be the end of the story and we'll become a new person. No, sir, that's not the way that it works. It's a struggle. We must change the heart so that we can change our tongues. And by controlling the tongue, we will exercise greater mastery over the other members of our body. We all struggle with our tongues. We all struggle with the sins of the tongue and other sins in our lives. All of us have allowed stuffs to enter our mind and Allow things to enter a heart that we never should have. I know what I need to do. I need to remember that dinner bell. Quit ringing the bell. And to forgive. I can't forget. None of us can. But to forgive. To forgive myself. And to press on. To continue, to continue on. Think on the things that are pure and lovely and just and honest as Paul mentions in the book of Philippians. Do me a favor this week. Let's all together work on controlling our tongues when we're with other people. And when we're not with other people, let's continue to control our tongue and what enters our minds and our hearts. 
because what's inside is what comes forth. I hope that you have a wonderful week this week.